Dr. William Lane Craig is a world leading Christian scholar in philosophy and theology joining us today. Could you all join me in giving him a warm welcome? Thank you. Um, Dr. Lane Craig, could you just tell us a little bit about what you're working on at the moment? All right. Now, that wasn't entirely clear to me. The audio wasn't real good. Would, would I tell you a little bit about what? What you're working on at the moment. Yes. Uh, since the pandemic started about three years ago, I have been embroiled in writing a multi-volume systematic philosophical theology. So this is going to be a survey of the whole body of Christian doctrine from beginning to end, but with a special emphasis upon the philosophical issues that arise in the course of uh, doing Christian theology. I'm about halfway through now. I've written several volumes and still have a few to go, and it's been a, a challenging but very rewarding experience. Yeah, go for it, um, As a Christian apologist, how do you defend the God, and, like the characteristics of classical fears and gods, from the arguments that God, if a God predestined and it's not only the level huh. Now, as a Christian systematic theologian, I begin with the teaching of Scripture, the uh, Judeo-Christian Scriptures contained in the Bible. And I couple that with St. Anselm's notion of perfect being theology, so that, for example, the Bible teaches that God is almighty or all-powerful. But what does that mean? Well, that is to be construed along the lines of St. Anselm's uh, thinking that God is a maximally great being, and so one will extrapolate that attribute to the greatest possible degree. Similarly, the Bible says that God is all-knowing, and perfect being theology would then extrapolate that to the concept of omniscience. Um, the Bible says that God exists forever and never came into being, and one would then extrapolate that along the lines of perfect being theology to say that God is a metaphysically necessary being. So first and foremost, my project is based in scriptural teaching and perfect being theology. Now, in addition to that, one will often encounter arguments of so-called natural theology that do not appeal to authoritative scripture that also will yield many of these divine properties and attributes. For example, I think that one of my favorite arguments, the Kalam cosmological argument, gives us a being which is uh, absolutely first, beginningless, uncaused, uh, timeless, spaceless, immaterial, enormously powerful, if not omnipotent, and personal. And those would be some of the key attributes of the traditional concept of God. Now, having said that, I, I'm not entirely in agreement with what is sometimes called classical theism. Namely, I, I don't think that God is timeless uh, right now. I think that at the moment of creation, he enters into time in order to sustain relationships with the temporal world that he has made. So, I do not think that God is presently timeless. I also do not think that God is simple in the very strong sense that Thomas Aquinas articulated. I think that God is simple in the sense that many of the church fathers understood this, namely he's not composed of parts which might come apart. Uh, if God has any parts, they would be metaphysically inseparable. They could never come apart. So I, I'm not committed to this very, very strong doctrine of divine simplicity, which says that all of God's properties are really the same, and that he is identical to his properties, and that even his essence is identical to his existence. So those would be some of the properties ascribed to God by certain theists in the Thomistic tradition that I would not hold to. How would you respond to Hume's criticism of Aquinas' Aquinas's cosmological argument in which he accused 
this is requirements of taking an inductive leap to an a priori conclusion a priori inclusion of a transcendent being specifically david hume's criticisms of oh. the cosmological argument and, and what your thoughts about Hume's criticisms are and and how you would refute them is that, is that um and is, yeah, it, is exactly. it a specific argument uh, yes yeah, spe yeah specifically the um how um aquinas takes an inductive leap to an a priori conclusion so make so making an inductive leap um, okay, I'm not sure what inductive leap he's referring to there. Let, let me say, in my work on the Kalam cosmological argument, I try to show that none of Hume's uh, objections uh, hold against that argument, that the causal principle is a sort of metaphysical first principle that even Hume himself actually believed in, uh, Hume wrote to John Stuart in, I believe, 1741, that he never affirmed so absurd a proposition as that something might come into being without a cause. He said simply that uh, we cannot prove this through either demonstration or intuition, so that it, the belief comes from another source. But Hume himself clearly believed in the causal principle. And you can also show that Hume believed that there could not be an infinite temporal regress of events in the past. So actually, uh, Hume really accepted the key premises in the Kalam cosmological argument. With respect to his other criticisms of the cosmological argument, I think that there are good reasons to believe that a modest principle of sufficient reason is true, and that therefore the universe does not exist just as a brute fact. Uh, while Leibniz's very strong version of the principle may not be true, a modest version, for example, every thing that exists has an explanation of its existence, either in the necessity of its own nature or in an external cause. I think that very modest principle is very plausibly true and is sufficient to generate a good cosmological argument. Um, now, having said that, I would say that Thomas's arguments are, to a degree, I think, outmoded and need to be updated. Every generation needs to refurbish the traditional arguments to make them relevant for today. So Aquinas's first way, for example, I think probably presupposes a Ptolemaic cosmology in which the earth is at the center of the universe and is surrounded by these concentric spheres that require there to be an unmoved mover, such as Aristotle envisioned, outside the outermost sphere. And that's obviously an astronomically antiquated worldview that would need to be in some way refurbished to make the argument um, compelling today. His third way, based upon the real distinction between essence and existence, is one that I do not agree with because it is underlaid by these um, strong metaphysical principles that every contingent thing is composed of essence and existence, that there is a real, not a conceptual, but a real distinction between a thing's essence and then the act of being, which is added to it. And I just don't see any reason to accept that sort of Thomistic metaphysics. So I prefer versions of the cosmological argument that presuppose as little metaphysical baggage as possible so that they will have a very broad sort of appeal and not be system dependent upon a peculiar metaphysical undergirding. Uh, does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Other, other questions? Yeah, go on, Elia. Um, I was wondering what your opinion on criticisms of the Bible based on language translation errors are, such as the lack of capitalization in the Greek that the New Testament was written in. One example would be that Jesus is described as the Son of Man with a capital S which is different to where other people in the Bible are described as son of, uh, so, sorry, son of God. Um, son of God in other people in the Bible is described with a lowercase s, but in the Greek, the New Testament was written in, there are no capital 
Right, right, exactly. Uh, the This is a convention of modern English, and I think it's probably because it's a title. Um, it's not just describing Jesus as a son of man, a human being, such as the prophet Ezekiel uh, described himself as, but rather it is a title that refers to this divine human figure in the book of Daniel, who is prophesied to uh, come and to whom God gives all rule and authority that all people and nations should worship and serve him. And I think in view of that honorific title, the caps are used in English translations, but I wouldn't get hung up on that if I were you. Um, as you say, our exegesis will have to depend upon the original Greek text um, and not upon English translations. Um, you mentioned God as metaphysically necessary being. Um, I know you're quite a big fan of the cosmological argument. Is it not possible that there's actually just merely a gap in scientific knowledge and understanding between what we know and what else could have been uh, a cause of the universe as opposed to God? Well, now, there are different versions of the cosmological argument. The Kalam cosmological argument actually doesn't infer or lead to the conclusion that God is a metaphysically necessary being. Rather, he has those properties that I mentioned before, beginningless, uncaused, timeless, spaceless, etc. It's the Leibnizian version of the cosmological argument that leads to God's being a metaphysically necessary being. And that's required by, I think, the first premise that everything has an explanation of its existence. Why is there this thing rather than not? And such an explanation can be found only either in an external cause of that thing or else in the necessity of that thing's nature. Now, certainly it is open to the skeptic to say that that principle is true and that the universe is the metaphysically necessary being. The universe exists by a necessity of its own nature. And I've tried to argue that that is not a plausible candidate for being a necessary being because the universe is simply the aggregate or agglomeration of all of these contingent beings that there are, uh, none of which is metaphysically necessary, and therefore it's plausible that the universe is not itself necessary. In particular, if you say that the universe is simply composed of all of these fundamental particles like quarks or um, quantum fields, these particles and fields are contingent in a number of ways, and contemporary cosmologists routinely entertain um, models uh, that differ in their fundamental constituents. So I think that it is less plausible to think that the universe is metaphysically necessary than to think that it is a transcendent being who is the external cause of the universe. And I might say that that argument, I think, is dramatically confirmed if the universe began to exist. If the universe did, in fact, begin to exist at a point in the finite past, then it is clearly not metaphysically necessary, because a metaphysically necessary being that exists necessity of its own nature must be an eternal being. It cannot come into existence. It cannot fail to exist. And so the beginning of the universe would, I think, make it decisive that the universe is not a, a thing that exists by a necessity of its own nature. Uh, in the Kalan cosmological argument, the first premise says that everything that begins to exist has a cause, but we have never observed anything empirically, um, and we have never observed empirically anything begin to exist. Everything we make and everything that arises from natural processes are compounded of pre-existing components. We have no experience of something like beginning to exist. So do you not think that the first premise seems to be a guess? Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, obviously wrong. Uh, my third argument in support of the first premise 
uh, inductive argument. The first two are metaphysical arguments that something cannot come into being from nothing, and that if something could come into being from nothing, then it becomes inexplicable why everything and anything doesn't come into being from nothing, which contradicts experience. But the third argument is inductive. That is to say, when we survey things that begin to exist, we inevitably find that they do have causes. Uh, and therefore, the inductive scientific empirical support for that premise is as strong as it could possibly be. Uh, for example, I began to exist. I have not always existed. I came into being when uh, I was conceived by my parents. And the idea that I pre-existed my own conception is absolutely absurd. Um, the Empire State Building began to exist. It wasn't there when the uh, British colonists arrived to colonize the New World. And so the idea that we never see things begin to exist is just patently false. I think what you're confused about is that the things that we see beginning to exist not only have efficient causes, but they are made out of previously existing materials, um, like the steel and the concrete and the glass that goes into the Empire State Building or the sperm and the egg that uh, resulted in my conception. And that's certainly true, that among things that begin to exist, we see not only that they have efficient causes, but that they also have material causes. When you get to the beginning of the universe, however, and we ask what sort of cause does the universe have? It cannot have a material cause because it is the beginning of all matter and energy of physical space and time themselves. And therefore it can have only an efficient cause that brings it into being. Um, but not a material cause. Do you not think that because we have, um, it's possible that because we have such a limited knowledge of the universe, that there is things out there that actually didn't have a cause that isn't God. And so that could show that actually the universe didn't necessarily need something to start it in the first place. And it could have been. Well, if, I, if I understand the question right, you're asking, couldn't the cause of the universe be something other than God? Um, and notice that in my conclusion to the argument, I don't say that this is God. What I say is that it gives us a beginningless, uncaused, timeless, spaceless, immaterial, enormously powerful, personal creator of the universe. Now, I think that's the core concept of what God is, but those attributes simply flow from what it is to be a cause of the universe, to bring space and time, matter and energy into existence. And so uh, whether you want to call this being God or not, it must have those attributes. And I can't think of anything else that could fit that description um, other than the God of theism. Um, I was just wondering why you think that uh, infinite regress of contingency isn't a very suitable approach. Uh -huh. The key here isn't contingency, I mean, at least in the Kalam argument. Um, the idea there is twofold. First, that it seems to me that the idea of the existence of an actually in number of things leads to metaphysical absurdities. And here there's just a wealth of thought experiments that you can do uh, about what it would be like if there could be, say, an infinite number of marbles or an infinite number of coins or an infinite number of people and, and so forth. And just inevitably, you generate situations that I think are metaphysically absurd. The other argument that I've defended is that even if you could have an actually infinite number of things, they could not come into being by successive addition. That is to say, you could not form an actually infinite collection of things by adding one member after another, because you never 
uh, can form an actual infinite by successive addition. A and since the past is formed by successive addition, and since if the past is beginningless, there would be an actually infinite number of past events, it would follow, therefore, that the past cannot be beginningless, that it must be finite uh, and have a beginning at some time in the finite past. So those are the two philosophical arguments that I've offered for the finitude of the past and the beginning of the universe. Uh, fortunately, those two philosophical arguments are now scientifically confirmed by two very dramatic empirical confirmations. And there I'm speaking of the expansion of the universe, uh, the so-called Big Bang model that was formulated by Friedman and Lemaitre following Einstein's formulation of his general theory of relativity. And then secondly, the thermodynamic properties of the universe, which show that it cannot have existed from infinity past, but must have had a beginning a finite time ago at which its energy was initially put in and it's been running down ever since in accord with the second law. So we have both philosophical arguments and scientific confirmations to support the second critical premise of that argument that the universe began to exist. Um, let's say you had a timer uh, set for one minute and a marble in front of you, and uh, you set the timer off. In 30 seconds, you would duplicate the marble, and then 15 seconds goes by, you duplicate it again, and then 7.5 seconds, etc. And you keep duplicating this. In theory, at zero seconds, I'm not saying this is realistic, but at zero seconds, should you not have an infinite number of marbles? I think that these sorts of super tasks are metaphysically impossible to complete. Um, they uh, involve what I would say merely potential actions that can never actually be completed. If you could form an actual infinite by, say, moving one marble the first minute and then another marble in 30 seconds, then another in 15 seconds, then another in seven and a half seconds. At the end of the uh, two minutes, all the infinite marbles would have been moved. But you could ask, what moved the last marble to its place? There cannot be an answer to that question because in such an infinite series, there is no last member. Uh, and therefore, there is a causal gap uh, in the story that cannot be bridged by anything. The existence of the heap of marbles at the end cannot have a sufficient cause for its formation because of that gap. Uh, and, and therefore, I think this kind of increasingly rapid sequential formation of an infinite is metaphysically impossible. But in any case, even if you do think that you could form an infinite in that way, I can grant that point, and the argument against the infinity of the past will still go through, because the infinity of the past was not formed by this kind of a diminishing interval uh, converging toward in infinity. Um, the intervals into which the past is divided are not potential and they are not decreasing. They are equal, like an equal number of seconds or an equal number of minutes or an equal number of years and so forth. They're, and, and therefore, they're not analogous to these sort of Zeno's paradoxes examples that you mentioned, which always involve uh, an a merely potential infinite uh, of decreasing intervals. Um, yeah, go on, Elliot. Um, I was wondering what you thought about not just Christian theism and Christianity as a religion or any of the modern religions, I mean, you can take ancient religions as we can't hit, but don't you think that religion spawned as a, as a need to control people? Because religion has always, I mean, necessarily might not be in all cases today, but religion has always controlled people in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And has always been the method of doing that. Well, you know, I, I'm not carrying any brief in defense of religion here. 
Um, that's a sociological question. And I'm sure you're absolutely right that religions have often historically been a means of controlling and manipulating people. That was what led to the Enlightenment in Europe, uh, the French Revolution and all the rest, where the uh, church and the monarchy were thrown off in the name of human autonomy and free thought. So your sociological comment may very well be correct, but I think, as I say, that there are good reasons to believe that God exists, and I further believe that there are good reasons to think that the historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, described in the New Testament documents, um, was in fact God's decisive divine revelation to humanity. So those questions are independent of these sociological abuses of religion. In fact, you know, on a Christian worldview, where we believe that human beings are inherently sinful and fallen, it isn't at all surprising that religion would be twisted and abused by fallen sinful people to control and, and manipulate others. This is almost exactly what you would expect, that the most beautiful and, and good things would be twisted to evil ends. Um, it's been rightly said, wherever there's honey, there will, there will always be flies. Uh, and so we shouldn't really be surprised, I think, at the abuses to which religion has been put. Is it logical to make assertions about things well beyond our epistemic distance, such as God the Creator? Oh. Well, yes, I, I, I definitely think that's true. We are not confined to merely talking about our sense impressions that we read from the immediate world around us, uh, but we can make inferences uh, that go beyond that. I mean, to, to just give an example that would be non-theological, think of the study of mathematics and logic, the whole universe of sets and set theory that follows from that, and all of the different branches of mathematics. This is certainly a realm of knowledge that is vastly beyond what we learn from sense. And similarly, the study of history. Uh, one of the things that historians often talk about is the fact that the events of the past are gone. They are irretrievably gone behind the veil of the past. And yet historians reconstruct the course of the past on the basis of the evidence that is left in the present. And in the same way, the natural theologian, I think, can draw certain philosophical and metaphysical inferences based upon uh, the evidence that we do have, as well as certain intuitive metaphysical principles, such as that something cannot come into being without a cause. Uh, yeah, go on, again, Elliot. Uh, do you believe that if God created, well, you do believe that God created our world and created our universe, do you believe that if this universe was to end, or even simultaneously, there could be another universe created by the same God? All right. If I understood the question you're asking, uh, since I believe that God created the universe, do I think that the universe will end someday? No. no. Just that you create another one, that he could create, that the same God oh. could create the universe. Yes, I, I think that he could. I don't see why not. Um, it, he could create... Uh, a universe would be in a different space-time so that it wouldn't intersect with ours, um, and there we would have no access to it. So I don't see any reason to think that a transcendent being like God is could not create multiple um, independent space-times. Well, thank thank you so much for for taking the time. I, I just want to express how um, how grateful we are. Um, it, you know, it's it's a wonderful experience for for our pupils to you know have you here. Today. So I, I just want to you know show show my appreciation. For in in um, their studies, they 
for uh, philosophy of religion, they get taught um, Aquinas's third way for contingency and necessity. Ah. Bertrand Russell's criticisms, which doesn't directly correlate, interestingly enough. Um, also, Anselm's a priori argument, Galmillo and Kant's response, and then there's Paley's analogical argument and Hume's criticisms. It's, it's a bit of a shame that they don't actually study your version of the Kalam cosmological argument, to be honest. But, you know, that's the way it goes. And, and that's what what we effectively oh, have to teach. Do you? Well, no, that's interesting, because when we were in Britain before, they showed me our e-books that did include discussions of the Kalam cosmological argument that were used in schools. Yeah, sure. Um, perhaps a different example to what to the one that we're studying here. Um, yes. We we do teach it, but more as sort of a, an evaluation rather than to, you know, they might get us specifically to unpack Aquinas's third way. Yeah. We recently a video of yours talking about Bertrand Russell and his fallacy of composition and how it doesn't work. Are you able to elaborate on that? Um, sure. The fallacy of composition is inferring that because a part of an object has a certain property, therefore the entire object uh, has that property. Um, and that is clearly fallacious. Uh, think, for example, of an elephant. You can chop up the elephant into little pieces so that every part of the elephant is light in weight, but that doesn't imply that the entire elephant is light in weight. The fact is that holes can have properties um, that are not had by any of its individual parts. Now, some people have alleged that the cosmological argument commits the fallacy of composition by inferring that because every part of the universe is caused, therefore the whole universe is caused. And that would indeed be fallacious if that were the way the argument went. But I don't know of anybody who argues in that way. The argument is not that when you divide the universe up into parts, that every part of the universe has a cause and therefore the whole thing has a cause. That just isn't the way the argument goes. Rather, it would go like my argument, for example, that every thing that begins to exist has a cause. Uh, that would be the causal principle. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. Or Leibniz's argument that everything that exists has um, an explanation of its existence, either in an external cause or in the necessity of its own nature. The universe uh, is something that exists, uh, and therefore the universe has a cause, uh, an explanation, either in the necessity of its own nature or in an external cause. And since the universe doesn't exist by a necessity of its own nature, uh, it has an external cause. So the traditional cosmological arguments just don't reason by composition as this alleged fallacy uh, would have it. Thank you. Uh, and onto the ontological argument, you often reference Alvin planting his version. Yes. What are your, what are your thoughts on Anselm? I became not? convinced that Anselm's argument, at least in Plantinga's version, I mean to say, is in fact a sound argument and a, a cogent argument. And that was quite a surprise for me because I was for many years skeptical of it. But it seems to me that there are good reasons to believe that it's possible that a maximally great being exists, uh, such as Anselm described, uh, and that if, if that's possible, then such a being is actually, actually exists. And in writing my systematic philosophical theology, I have come across new arguments offered by people like Cesar Bernstein and Joshua Rasmussen in support of that key modal premise of the ontological argument that it's possible that a maximally great being exists. And this, again, has been a surprise to me, but I find these arguments to be quite persuasive. And so I'm actually more convinced now of the cogency of the ontological argument than when I began this uh, this book. <laughs>
Thank you. And, and, and when you say cogency, uh, in uh, the specification, our pupils need to consider uh, the status of proof and the relationship between reason and faith. Would you mind sort of elaborating on what you mean by Thank cogency you. of the argument? Thank you for that clarification question. I spoke of the soundness of the argument, that is to say, the argument is logically valid, its conclusion follows from its premises, and the premises are true, uh, and therefore the argument is sound. But not every sound argument is a cogent argument. By cogency, I mean that there is, there is good reason or evidence to believe that the premises are true, independent of your belief in the conclusion. And many people have said that the ontological argument, even if it's sound, it's not cogent because they don't think there are good reasons to believe that key modal premise that it's possible that a maximally great being exists. But as I say, I have now come to um, realize that there are some pretty persuasive arguments in support of that first premise, so that I think the argument is not only sound, but actually cogent. That is, it's a good argument. It's one that ought to commend itself to us. Now, that doesn't mean it's certain that the, the conclusion is certain. Uh, that That's a red herring or, or a will-o'-the-wisp. Um, I mean that the conclusion is more probable than not, and that therefore we ought to believe it. That's interesting you say that it isn't certain, because the way that our um, syllabus teaches it is going from actually, if, if the ontological argument works, the syllogism leads to a certain conclusion. Um, so, oh. but, but yeah, oh. if, yeah, go on, go on. Yeah, okay? At least with planning as argument, that's not true, because the support for the key first premise um, is in many cases a posteriori. As I say, there are these arguments, for example, Josh Rasmussen's argument from moral experience for the truth of that premise, uh, or other considerations in support of that premise. And so it, it doesn't lead to certainty, um, but to it's being more probable than not. That's really interesting. Thank you. And thanks for the clarification. Okay, good question. Um, yeah, here. Um, is God's benevolence really plausible given all of the unnecessary suffering both in and because of the natural world? Now, obviously, anything I say here is going to sound soundbite-ish and therefore trivial and inadequate, but I've written on this subject, for example, in my book, Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview, it has a lengthy chapter on the problem of suffering and evil that I would commend to you. But basically, I, I make some distinctions here. I distinguish between what I call the emotional problem of evil and the philosophical or intellectual problem of evil. And I think that for most people, this is really an emotional problem. They've never really thought it through in great depth but they simply react emotionally to the idea that a good and all-powerful God could permit the <clears throat> suffering that we experience in the world. But when I consider the argument as a purely philosophical exercise, it seems to me that it is very difficult for the atheist to prove either that it's impossible that an all-loving, all-powerful God should permit evil, or that it's highly improbable that an all-powerful, all-loving God should permit evil. The atheist has to assume that if God has morally sufficient reasons for allowing the evil and the suffering in the world, these reasons ought to be evident to us. And when you think about it, that is just utterly implausible. Given God's providence over human history, uh, he guides history uh, with a, a prevision of the ends he wants to achieve in the future, there's absolutely no reason that we, confined to our local space and time and with our limited intelligence and insight, ought to be able to discern the reasons for which God permits some incident of evil or suffering to enter our lives. 
His morally sufficient reason for that might not emerge until centuries from now, maybe in another country, and the reasons might be so complex that we would be unable to, to fathom them. So I think the atheist has shouldered here an enormous burden of proof that he simply cannot bear. At the same time, I would say that there are very good reasons to believe that God exists that act as a counterweight to any improbability that the existence of suffering and evil would seem to throw upon existence. I think that most philosophers who press the problem of suffering and evil as a disproof of God, if you read them, I think you'll find they inevitably believe that there are no good reasons to believe in God, and that therefore there's just nothing on the other side of the scale to outweigh the improbability arising from evil and suffering. I, however, think that there are very weighty reasons for God's existence on the other side of the scale, including moral reasons for God's existence. In fact, I think there's actually a good argument from evil for the existence of God, uh, and it would go like this. If God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Everything becomes relative. Secondly, evil exists. That's the premise put forward by the atheist, from which it follows three, therefore, objective moral values do exist, from which it follows logically, therefore, God exists. So it seems to me that if um, evil actually does exist, then it proves the existence of God, because in the absence of God, nothing would really truly be objectively good or evil. So he believes that the matter of evil, just, you're going down to semantics there, because you said that evil is defined by objective moral values. Some people who do evil things don't think they're doing evil things. They think they're doing the right thing. So surely we can have evil with relative moral values. I think you can have natural suffering without moral values. Uh, but I don't think you can have moral evil without objective moral values existing. So take the recent atrocities perpetrated by Hamas. The uh, fighters in Hamas think that what they're doing is morally good. They don't think that it's evil. They think that it's justified. But that doesn't make it morally justified. They They can simply be morally mistaken. I think they have a moral blind spot where they do not accurately perceive the true immorality of what they're doing. So objective morality, which is what I'm talking about, doesn't depend upon our perceptions. Now, if objective, if things are objectively evil or good, then I think it follows that you have to have God as the absolute standard that determines what is good and what is evil. In the absence of a transcendent plumb line, there is no objective moral value and everything just becomes relative. Now, having said that, I think you're quite right in saying that you can have suffering that is not morally evil. For example, the suffering caused by a tsunami that sweeps over the islands destroying the, the population there, or uh, a plague, or a pandemic, uh, or falling down the stairs, or being involved in an accident. These involve often horrible suffering, terrible suffering, but there is no moral dimension to these, and that's why it's typically called natural evil, which is really something of a misnomer. Uh, it's natural suffering, but it doesn't have a moral dimension and therefore isn't moral evil. Thank you. And so what I've said would apply to natural evils as well as moral evils. Uh, that is to say what I said about the burden of proof that the atheist has to shoulder. Uh, obviously, my argument for the existence of God is based upon the moral evil in the world, not the natural suffering to which one might point. Thank you. Yeah. So what do you think is the main reason people don't believe in a God of theism, even after listening to your views? Hmm. <laughs> I would say that it is probably due to indifference. 
Um, in other words, the reasons are not philosophical or intellectual, they're, they're social. Um, the people just don't seem to see the need for it. Um, religion turns them off. Um, I don't think they've thought deeply enough about the consequences of an atheistic worldview in terms of the meaning, value, and purpose in life. I think that the logical consequences of an atheist's worldview are very dark uh, and lead ultimately to despair. And it's not just I that think that way, but many prominent atheists such as Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, Bertrand Russell would agree with me uh, uh, about that. And therefore, I think that atheism is ultimately existentially unlivable. The atheist has to live in contradiction to his worldview because it's impossible to live consistently and happily as though your life were valueless, meaningless, and purposeless. And so we make leaps of faith to affirm the meaning, value, and purpose in our lives, uh, even though we have no basis for doing that if we do not affirm the reality of God. So I think that people just haven't thought very deeply about this, and therefore for social reasons um, and indifference and seeing no need of God, they tend to be agnostic uh, about these matters. What do you think? I I'd be interested in hearing from you. You're, you're more in touch with young people than I am. Why do you think that so many people don't believe in God? Um, I mean, I guess I would agree to a degree about what you were saying. I think it's mainly okay. so, um, like, so obviously, you know, we study philosophy here and we, you know, are trying to reason and things like that. But I feel like in, uh, you know, for to have a belief in God of theism, some people believe that it goes beyond reason and that it's to do with faith. And I feel like some people aren't really necessarily ready to make that leap. Or just yes. believe that, you know, it's, you know, that leap shouldn't be made. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, thank you. I wonder, too, to what degree many people think that religion or religious belief would inhibit the kind of lifestyle that they want to adopt. The, they want to engage in activities that they know traditional Christianity or Judaism or Islam would condemn as immoral, um, and therefore uh, they reject those religions in order to adopt their preferred lifestyle. You know, how, do, how do you find um, opponents in debates nowadays? Because obviously you've de debated the, the famous Christopher Hitchens, yeah. um, you debated Lawrence Krauss, who was really quite rude, wasn't he, during that debate? Um, Sam Harris <laughs> debated and Justin Briley's written a book about, I haven't read the book actually but it's more that was sort of coming out the other side of this new atheist almost a, 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 you know you've been on the receiving end of it almost sort of I'm going to say aggressive I'm trying to think of the right word but you know it was quite full on <laughs> wasn't it yeah I, I put myself in the way of it I mean <laughs> yeah, yeah. I went out to meet them um, yeah Yes, and I read Justin's book uh, where he claims that the new atheism is now a spent force and has petered out and been largely rejected. And he's anticipating a, a, a revival of interest in uh, traditional Christian belief. What he shows, I think, convincingly in the book is that many thinkers today will admit that if this isn't true, that is to say, traditional Christian or theistic beliefs, if they're not, then we are in real trouble. Uh, it's almost as though we'd have to invent God if he doesn't exist in order to affirm the value, meaning, and purpose in, in life. And that's exactly what the existentialists back in the 30s and the 40s were saying. And I, I think that that lesson may be coming home and that the cheery optimism of the new atheists like Dawkins has now proved to be hollow and, and has been exposed. Sure, sure. And so some of our pupils here were at a conference with Alex O'Connor fairly recently in um, in Oxford. Um, uh -huh. And he, yeah, I, 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 I do prefer his 
his approach actually just how you know how how he debates and it just seems a lot more peaceful let's say oh. <laughs> well i i i've always tried to be gentlemanly and charitable in my debates with others to treat them in a a, a civil manner but they certainly are confrontational in the sense that I, I want to go after their arguments and show that they're not very good. And I want to show that the arguments I defend are cogent arguments. Um, so uh, it, it's my training, I suppose, in debate uh, in university and, and secondary school that uh, inclined me toward that that method. Oh, um do you think that it's actually possible for the doctrine of hell to be compatible with an omnibenevolent God? Do I think the doctrine of hell is compatible with the doctrine of an omnibenevolent God? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, I do think that because I think that as a maximally great being, God is not simply omnibenevolent, um, but he is also perfectly just. And therefore, he cannot just blink at evil in the world. Uh, every evil must receive its just desert if God is to be perfectly just. And so I think God, in a way, finds himself in a, a dilemma. He is as perfectly just as he is loving, um, and his love demands forgiveness and reconciliation, but his justice demands punishment for wrongs uh, rightly deserved. So how is this to be reconciled? Well, I think that's where Jesus Christ comes in. I think Jesus Christ is the reconciliation of God's love and justice. Uh, in the person of Christ, God enters into human history, and on the cross, Christ gives his life to satisfy the demands of God's justice. He bears the suffering that we deserved as the punishment for our sins, thereby freeing us from our liability to punishment. And that opens up the opportunity for God to offer us a free pardon of all our sins, all our wrongs, and reconciliation uh, with himself as well as moral cleansing, so that it is through the cross that the justice and um, love of God are perfectly reconciled. Now, if a person chooses to reject Christ's substitutionary atoning death as the payment for the satisfaction of divine justice, then there is no one else but yourself who then has to bear the penalty of that just desert. And so it's not God's desire that anyone should go to hell. Uh, he doesn't want anyone to be lost. His will is that everyone should come to a knowledge of himself and to find God's grace and forgiveness. And the only reason that some people would not would because, be because they freely and irrevocably reject God's grace and his every effort to save them. Um, so throughout history, there's been a trend where the more developed a country becomes, the less religious people there are because people don't really need a reason to believe in God. So do you think as um, we get richer and more developed, that the number of Christians will change? Like, do you think that they'll decrease and eventually die out? Or do you think there'll be a, more Christians? You know, uh, secular sociologists and psychologists have been predicting this for generations, uh, if not centuries, and it hasn't happened. Uh, the United States, in particular, is such a decisive counterexample to that trend. Uh, the United States is one of the richest nations on Earth, uh, also very advanced educationally with our university system and so forth. Uh, and yet it is also a place where uh, biblical Christianity is flourishing, and it sends out thousands of missionaries uh, throughout the world to uh, spread the message of the gospel and reach other people um, with the message of Christ. So it has not 
proven to be a reliable prediction that religion inevitably fades out with increasing uh, prosperity or education. I think that the dangers to Christian faith are not posed by prosperity or education so much as they are by um, the secular entertainment industry, um, which promotes secular values in the film and, and music industry that are so counter-Christian, uh, and that this so influences people in pop culture that it predisposes them to reject religious beliefs. So I see a much greater uh, threat to the future of religion to lie in the entertainment industry and and the wealth that it generates than simply in a prosperous and educated population. Um, how do arguments for the existence of God actually complement Christianity instead of other, other monotheist, monotheistic religions? Mm -hmm. The arguments that I give establish a sort of generic monotheism that is consistent with Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and maybe with deism as well. In order to make the transition from that generic monotheism to Christian theism, I think you have to look at this historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, and ask yourself, who was this man? And to do that, you need to look at the New Testament documents and ask yourself, uh, are they historically reliable? What do they tell us about the life and claims of this man? And I think that when you do that, you can show that Jesus of Nazareth made radical personal claims whereby he put himself in the very place of God, and that it was for these claims that he was um, crucified on the charges of blasphemy by the Jewish leadership. But I think that there are good reasons to believe that Jesus rose from the dead, that God raised him from the dead, and in this very public and decisive way vindicated those allegedly blasphemous claims for which he was crucified. So I see Jesus' claims and resurrection as being the decisive evidence for thinking that Christian theism, rather than mere Judaism or Islam, is true. Uh, do you think there's a problem with Christ being male? Oh. We, we had a talk from Daphne Hampson yesterday. Have you come across her work? Yeah. I don't see any problem with Jesus being male. Um, he had to be either male. Well, maybe even saying that, I show how old-fashioned I am saying he had to be male or female. But no, I, I don't see any problem at all in thinking that Jesus was male. Uh, a greater problem maybe would be conceiving of God as male, and I don't think that we should do that. I don't think God has a gender. Um, but Jesus taught us to relate to God as a, our heavenly Father, uh, because this metaphor of God as our Father communicates to us both parental love uh, and affection, along with parental authority that was invested in, typically in the Father uh, at that time. So that would be, I think, more problematic would be how you think of God, but that Jesus was biologically male, it's just irrelevant to his revelation of God, and then especially the efficacy of his self-sacrificial atoning death on our behalf. You, you don't have to be um, a particular gender in order for one to offer this kind of self-sacrificial atoning death. I notice your skull behind behind you. Um, yes. Would you mind in, in lighting our students about, uh, my students about the, is that to do with the historical Adam and your research yes. on the historical Adam? Um, <laughs> this is a life-size replica
of the skull of Homo heidelbergensis. My wife, Jan, gave me this for my birthday because <laughs> in my book, In Quest of the Historical Atom, my hypothesis is that it is perfectly compatible with the uh, facts of modern science and paleoanthropology that the entire human race descended from an original founding pair who belonged to the species Homo heidelbergensis, from which Neanderthals, Denisovans, and Homo sapiens all descended. And they probably lived somewhere prior to 750,000 years ago. And so this skull, skull is a, a souvenir and, and reminder of that hypothesis. Um, I think we've got enough time for one more question. Go on. Okay. So especially in the Church of England at the moment, numbers are sort of lacking and Christianity sort of falling. Um, would you say that that is because uh, Christianity is out of touch with the sort of modern morals of today? Um, and if so, should Christianity adapt to change? Yeah. I think that Christianity today is out of sync with contemporary secular morality. Yes, I do agree with that. When I was a college student in the 1960s, that was the era of the counterculture. And the counterculture uh, was typically against the war in Vietnam. It was against middle-class morality and uh, against authority and so forth. And even though that counterculture of the 60s has now faded away, uh, or perhaps more accurately, uh, it would be to say that it's become establishment, I believe that we who are Christians are called today to be countercultural. I think we are really those who are truly countercultural because we have a different system of moral values uh, than do many secular thinkers. Uh, and so I do not think that we should compromise. I recognize that this makes it much more difficult to be a Christian and to um, promote Christian faith in our contemporary Western society. Uh, that is clearly true, but I do not think that the answer to that is to accommodate ourselves to culture. Rather, I think we are called to stand up for truth and for light and to be countercultural. Our, our system of values should be rooted in God and in the objective moral values that are determined by his character and being. And therefore, we, we cannot uh, compromise to accommodate ourselves to a secular uh, anti-Christian system of values. Yancey's keen to ask one more question. Is that okay? Just one question before you go? Yes. Uh, what are your views on Darwin's theory of evolution? Ah, wow, that would take uh, uh, an hour to share. There's a long excursus in this contemporary uh, systematic philosophical theology that I am writing. And I think perhaps... Why there's so much to say. Let me let me say this. I do not think that the most plausible interpretation of the book of Genesis is that Genesis teaches some sort of young earth creationism. Uh, I think that the book of Genesis is fully compatible with God's using evolution to create the biosphere and humanity. So I have no theological objection to contemporary evolutionary theory. I think it's fully compatible with the Bible. So for me, the question is, therefore not theological, it's scientific. Is the contemporary theory of biological evolution the best theory supported by the evidence? And, and here I would simply say, that one of the most important things to understand about contemporary evolutionary theory is that that theory is itself evolving. Um, there are at least three stages in the evolution of the theory of evolution since Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species in 1859. 
First stage was Darwin's original theory, which postulated common descent of all living things and natural selection as the mechanism for explaining the evolution of new species. While people very rapidly came to adopt common descent, uh, Darwin's theory for the next 70 years was virtually dead in the water because scientists did not think that natural selection provided an adequate explanation for the origin of new species and biological complexity. That lack was remedied by the second stage in the evolution of evolutionary theory, which was the so-called modern synthesis, sometimes called neo-Darwinism. The modern synthesis was a synthesis of Darwin's natural selection with Gregor Mendel's genetics, and it proposed that the origin of evolutionary no uh, novelty arises through random mutations of the genes that are then acted upon by natural selection. Well, that second stage of the theory came to be the received wisdom until almost the end of the 20th century, where it is now being replaced by a third stage, which is called the extended evolutionary synthesis. And proponents of the extended evolutionary synthesis believe that the modern synthesis is now obsolete, that it's explanatorily inadequate, that it was obsessed with genes as the source of evolutionary novelty and needs to be supplemented by uh, adjacent fields of biological study, particularly developmental biology or what used to be called embryology. And this extended evolutionary synthesis is incomplete it's in turmoil. Um, it has not reached firm, permanent conclusions. Uh, and so the, the jury is still out on what a final adequate theory of biological evolution will look like. Eugene Koonin, who is a very prominent evolutionary biologist, says um, that I don't know what, what the future holds, what the final synthesis will look like, or if there even will be one. But he says, I can make one prediction with confidence. He says, when we celebrate the 200th anniversary of the origin of the species in 2059, he says the, uh, the landscape of evolutionary biology will look vastly different than it does today. Dr. Craig, thank you so, so much for taking time out of your day today to to speak with us here at Camford. Um, can we all come together and give Dr. Craig a bit? Oh, well, thank you so much. I, I treasure the memories of my visit to Canford and uh, just am really glad that we can do this virtually and continue the conversation. Yeah, thank you. We, we massively appreciate it. And, and you and Janet are most welcome. If you're ever back in the UK, do, do come back uh, and visit we us. We will.